Welcome to the Kingdom. I'm Chris, and this is Good Enough Gaming. Howdy folks, it's the end of June, which means it's time to look back over the month and see what's been happening in the world of One Page Rules. So, once again, let's start out by looking at some of the beautifully painted models that were submitted to the monthly painting competition, and to give credit to those folks who put in all that time and effort, but didn't unfortunately win any of the official prizes, so they deserve at least an honorable mention. So first in the solo category, Kudo here to Lucas for adding additional elements to the model to make it truly unique. I have no idea what he used for that ghostly smoke or ectoplasm, but painting the entire model in a ghostly color and then adding the wisps of green spirit on the spear and the hooves is a really unique idea. In fact, the submission that won the army painting category entirely did something very similar. So good job to Lucas there. Next up is Saldox submission, which managed to bring in a lot of color, and that's typically unusual for an undead army. And he also did a great job with those highlights, especially on the green armor. Our third honorable mention in the solo category is Dusky Lad, who makes a regular appearance in these painting competitions and has placed several times. I thought he managed to pull off a very difficult color palette here, using highly contrasting colors, but still managing to pull them together. Also, his edge highlighting is really spot on and really makes those colors pop. Now, moving into the unit category, I think Adragon here deserves attention simply for making white the primary color of his army. White is notoriously difficult to work with, and even if you have a good rattle can or airbrush for a base coat in white, any mistakes you make are very easy to see and very difficult to clean up. On top of that, the green gems and the hair offer a really nice contrast to the white that really draw your eye and grab your attention. Up next is Nathan Rose's unit of Stitched Horrors. And while the color scheme itself isn't anything bold or out of the ordinary, he's managed to use lots and lots of really dark, earthy tones without making everything look the same. Plus, that red inflamed flesh at the stitch points really sell the idea that these creatures have been recently sewn together and animated and really adds to a whole ambiance of the unit. Our third honorable mention goes to Kyle Schigner, who, like the previous unit, used pretty traditional colors on his werewolves, but has presented it in an outstanding fashion. Everything on these models, from the bases, to the teeth, to the scar on that shoulder of the guy in front, all of it looks great. I've heard it said that the best paint jobs don't look like paint jobs. They look like the model was produced that way in the first place. And if that's true, then these werewolves are a stellar example of that. Nice fine detail, very, very simple color scheme, but done super effectively. Now, moving into the legendary category, there were only five entries. And now that the competition, in addition to placing first, second, and third, also shows one random submission, means that of the five submissions, four of them appeared in the official uh, results for the painting competition, which unfortunately means one gets left out. And that's a bit of a shame, because Dane here has put a lot of work into this thing. I mean, look at the wood grains on the coffin lid. Look at the padding on the coffin interior. Look at how that piece of wood beam that's sticking out from the crypt roof has a charred tip on it. You can see that Dane gave attention to every little detail. Even the wrist shackles on the zombies got attention. When I first saw this model, one of the things I said is, it was going to take a lot to paint all of those. Now you could spray them all a base color, wash them all, and do a dry brush highlighting, but from the look of this, Dane painted each one individually, and that kind of attention deserves recognition. Now, finishing up, because the Undead Army finally got the last of their models and is complete, the painting competition included a submission for an entire army. And we had a similar situation as with the legendary creatures. There were five entries and four of them get official recognition. So let's give Steven here some attention. He's painting his infantry in black and yellow, a really striking color scheme that's very challenging because yellow is as irritating to paint with as white. 
He's also given lots of attention to the bases. And in his presentation for the photograph here, he's using a gaming mat as the backdrop so that the photo helps set the whole atmosphere and make it look like this is an army in the field rather than models being positioned for a photo shoot. So I think with a little bit more adjustment on the lighting and zooming in a bit more to really focus on the models and their details, this army would look even better. Okay, so now let's move on to some of the big events here. First, Age of Fantasy Quest Beta has moved from Patreon only to public. For those of you who play Dungeons and & Dragons and really like the combat side of that game, this is the game for you. There's not much of the role-playing element that you normally have in D&D in between battles and when you're you know, revisiting towns to restock and rest and get information. If that's not the side of D&D you like and you really just like rolling dice and moving models and, and killing things, Quest is for you. As I've said in previous review videos, Quest is more like a tabletop dungeon crawler. You build and level a character while battling, battling endless hordes of opponents and searching for loot and treasure on the way to completing a larger narrative objective. But you don't have to interact with characters in town, take charisma checks to see if you successfully haggle on the price of an item, and talking in character remains optional. I played one game to give it a try, and it's very, very fast paced. Rounds move quickly, and you have to think differently than you would in any of the other one page rule skirmish games. One of the biggest things you have to get used to is that activations don't alternate. All heroes go, then all the mobs go, based on uh, instructions in the AI flowchart that's included with the rules. So after that one game, my initial impression is that the game's fun. You and a small group of friends could have a really fun evening chopping your way through a campaign. The app and the beginner's guide have a few glitches, but this is a beta, so that's to be expected. I particularly want to give the app a big thumbs up. Once it's fully smoothed out, it will be a very cool addition to this game. It's been designed so that anyone can build their own hero on their own phone or tablet, and then the host can send out a link that everyone joins from their phones, and that way you don't have to worry as much about trying to coordinate everyone's data sheets and making sure you have all the information. Everyone just brings their stuff, they join in the Dungeon Master's game, so to speak, and then they play. So if you're familiar with D&D, D&D Beyond is kind of what uh, the Age of Fantasy quest is like for building and leveling your own character. So I look forward to playing it again once more of the wrinkles have been ironed out. Now, along with that note, with the release of Quest in public beta, One Page Rules has begun releasing STL files for specific hero models. Now, right now, there are four. There's a Saurian Fighter, a Beastman Wizard, a Human Ranger, and a Ratman Cleric. But Tano announced in the recent uh, live stream that he did earlier this week that a new hero is going to be released every single month. So you can expand your collection that way. And even if you don't play Quest, these models would be great to use in a D&D campaign, in skirmish games, as heroes or characters in your full-size one-page rules games. So you, you, just like as the game is models agnostic and you can bring anything in, the models that one-page rules produces, you can use in anything that will allow them. So um, I think it's a great step forward. The next item of business, in the live stream, Tano confirmed that there is going to be a world book for Age of Fantasy like the one released back in April, I believe it was, for Grim Dark Future. The plan is to publish sometime in 2024, but nothing more specific than that was offered. And I do notice that there is some artwork on the website about Age of Fantasy that seems rather new. I wonder if they're teasing some snippets of some of the new art that's been commissioned for the book. The next big announcement is the Assault on Malhadra. Every month, One Page Rules releases narrative missions to give a little flavor to players who might be getting bored with the six standard maps and missions. Then, the OPR will compile 18 of these missions and release it as a mission pack that you can get from uh, drive through RPG. So examples of this include Maximum Threat for Grimdark Future and All Out Assault for Grimdark Future Firefight. Assault on Malhadra is a, as Tano called it, a remastering of one of these collections. So it's the same missions, but they've been refined. 
They've been chained together in a narrative, they've been tidied up a bit, they've been flavored with new art to illustrate the story, and now they will be made available for players to enjoy. And as he summed it up, he said, if a narrative campaign is like watching a movie, these mission packs are like watching a war documentary. So check those out if you're looking for some variety in your games and you really like the idea of a narrative setting that gives you something to work with as you're playing through the missions. Now the last big announcement is that the next Grimdark Future army to get an overhaul is the Human Defense Force. During the monthly hangout, Tano showed off some of the new concept art. And while he was very clear to point out that these are early designs and do not accurately reflect what the final STL files will look like, he did mention that they convey the general aesthetic that he wants the HDF to have, and that is he wants it to look very sci-fi, very futuristic. So in addition to the infantry, the new army models or STL files will include battle suits, fully uh, autonomous um, war robots, and lots and lots of vehicles. And when he showed the sketches for the vehicles, I was particularly drawn to a couple of them, like the dune buggy here, the spider tank, and the super heavy. I think those look really, really nice. I was a little less excited about his description of the heavy weapons teams that look less like a weapons team and more like a cute couple riding a tandem bike. I mean, look at this. Isn't that adorable? Okay, so that's the big news. Let's end off now taking a look at the monthly model releases and let's start with the next installment of the High Elf Fleets. The STL file is coming along nicely. And while, as I said, I've never been personally drawn to elves in sci-fi, seeing the excellent paint jobs that people have been submitting to the painting competitions has definitely shown the allure that these models have. I must say, I do like the sniper. The way he's posed, the way he's equipped, I think it looks really, really good. It definitely gives off that lone wolf, don't F with me kind of a vibe. I also think the Revenant model, and for the Noble looks pretty good too. That double-bladed staff adds a really nice feature to the model to make it stand out. I fear for the fragility of that as a printed model, but design-wise, it looks really, really nice. Now, the environmental avatar, I think, looks fantastic. I've criticized some of the other elements of the line and said, yeah, they look a little too, um, you know, genre agnostic. As I mentioned, you can play them in fantasy or sci-fi, and they kind of would fit in either one. But even with that critique, I think the avatar looks fantastic. Now, I personally have painted both of the designs of the avatar of Cain in 40K, the old pewter one that stands about three inches tall, and then the new Forge World one that stands about six inches tall. And I think that this STL file looks better than both of those. If you take a close look, there's all kinds of really intricate details from the stones that are hovering on flames just above the shoulders to the energy core that's in the torso. Anybody who's willing to give this model the paint job it deserves will have to set aside a lot of time, but I think the effort will be well worth it. I would definitely, however, go with the masked option for the face because the unmasked option looks a little bit too much like Ben Stiller. Moving on. In Age of Fantasy, this is the first batch of the new Shadowstalkers models that are being released. Now I've commented in previous videos about the overall aesthetic for me personally isn't doing it, but just like with the, uh, the High Elves, looking at some of the color schemes that people are coming up with, I think shows the real potential for this army. It's in choosing and delivering a color scheme that players will be able to give their Shadowstalkers armies a lot of individuality and flavor. So far, I've seen lots of players paint them in really, really bright schemes, which works because like the Rift Demons, you can paint these in super bright colors. You can paint these in super bright colors and it doesn't look out of place. There's no precedent for this army, unlike dwarves, elves, undead, that have a long history in fantasy writing in general, which influences the way we paint those. I mean, when was the last time you saw high elves painted truly grimdark? They're always painted as very bright, very sharp, very elegant. So the shadow stalkers here are going to allow painters to experiment with a lot of different color schemes. Now, as we can see here, there's no shortage of bright, colorful schemes but I can easily see these painted as very dark, 
very grimy, or as something infernal and hellish. So I will say that while I'm still not sold on the body designs, the details, the accents, the little decorations, shall we say, I think these give the army some very serious character and a little bit of creepy factor in a good way. Like take this guy here. He, like many of the other models, is blindfolded. I think this adds a ton of character because it makes you wonder, well, what's underneath the blindfold? Would we see burning eyes? Would we see empty sockets? It also makes you ask questions like, well, how does he go to war if he can't see anything? How does he see? If he senses it, does that mean he, he picks up and senses other things? It just, it's out of the ordinary, and so it makes you feel a little bit out of place. And that's what makes these shadow stalkers so creepy. And as again, as I said, I mean creepy in a good way here. So it's a great use of that tactic that you see in horror books and films where the reader or the viewer is given an unknown and they let their imagination take it from there. And as I just mentioned, I also think the trinkets and the decorations do a lot. Are these things trophies? Are they talismans? Where does he get them? What purpose do they serve? Again, put something unusual out there and let the mystery of it make it far more creepier than anything they could have specifically said about it. My only criticism here is the fork. That seems a little bit too comical. I mean, if you made it a fork that only had two tines, that would, I think you'd get away with that one because it looks very primitive. It looks kind of scary. It almost looks like a torture device. But the fork you have there, that's like a modern three-tined fork. And it makes me wonder if either A, he got that from a salad in a boxed lunch recently, maybe at a work retreat, or B, if when he dines, all of his trinkets are his utensils and he starts from the outside and works his way in. Other than that, though, I think these things are looking pretty good. And I think some of the, uh, the paint jobs and some of the ideas that players are coming up with to paint these are really making the army come alive. So that's it, folks, for the month of June. Thanks for watching. And until next month, keep your dice on the table. And remember, it doesn't have to be perfect as long as it's good enough.